ki a faki rori ki tiato e ronga rawa he monga rongo ki rongo ki te penua he fa karo pai ki a tato te kau papa tanga ta a tihai mauri ora papa tonu ko e tako to mai ki wahu te na koe e te fari e fa kama hana ti a tato te na koe e nga mati ona marai ka to te mutu haire 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 e nga mana e nga waka me nga reo a tina kaito tina kaito tina kaito ka to. Te iwi kāinga te ati awa rangatira kā nui te mihi, te ina rangatira tēnā kōroa, te whāna o te Kiwi Connect, tēnā kauta katoa, e ngā manuhiri o te au, nau mai, nau mai, haere mai ki Aotearoa nei. Kia ora, kia ora nā, talofa lava, mālo i le lei, mālo ni, ni sa volavanaka whakalofa lahi atu. Ko Nigel Bickle taku ingoa, te kai whakahaere o te rā tonga mānene, ko rohi o Porirua, e rangatira ko Erika, e ngā whā tamariki e ngā toro kōtero e tahi he tama. Hi everybody, I am Nigel Bickle, I'm the Head of Immigration New Zealand. Um, in the context of what today is all about in terms of New Zealand and New Zealand culture, uh, I wanted to start in the language of our indigenous people, the Māori. I'm not Māori, I'm full-blooded uh, European uh, Pākehā, but uh, I think in terms of the New Zealand way, um, really important to start by um, uh, addressing you in te reo Māori. Um, by way of translation, and I'm, I'm hoping in terms of our rangatira at the back, um, you know, uh, uh, probably not a 10 out of 10 effort, but uh, I hope what I've um, basically done is uh, firstly acknowledge God, uh, acknowledge the place that we stand, uh, acknowledge the people of this land, which is the Te Atiawa, uh, iwi, and uh, acknowledge all of our ancestors that have gone before us with whom out we wouldn't, wouldn't be here. Uh, I've introduced myself, obviously, as the Head of Immigration New Zealand, but uh, me as Nigel Bickle, the human being, I told you that uh, I hail from a little place over the hill called Porirua, where I was born and raised and continue to live, which is the um, tribal area of Ngāti, uh, Ngāti Toa Iwi. Uh, I'm married to Erica, have four kids, three, three daughters and a son. And uh, for me, you know, I'm a proud and passionate New Zealander. Uh, uh, my mother is a fourth uh, generation New Zealand European. Uh, my father was a migrant from Britain in the 1960s, what we colloquially refer to as the 10 pound poms. Uh, my wife is Māori, she is uh, Ngāpui from uh, the far north of the North Island, from a little town called uh, Kaio. Uh, her whānau is the Hikis, um, and her, uh, her father was a uh, Polish uh, refugee that arrived in New Zealand in 1948 after uh, the Second World War. So when I talk to my kids about our, our stories and migrant stories and look at my kids who are a little bit Polish, a little bit English, a little bit Kiwi, uh, sort of Pakeha, a little bit Māori, it's not a unique story in New Zealand because we are a migrant nation. Uh, we are a young nation, 175 years old, incredibly multicultural. So the things that you might or might not know, uh, we have the largest flows of people in the OECD. Uh, we are the second largest diaspora in the world after Ireland in terms of 25% of New Zealanders living away uh, from New Zealand, which conversely means we're all about attracting uh, others to come, on, to come on in. Our big export earning services sectors like tourism, international education, big export earning sectors like hort and viticulture, um, all reliant on uh, sort of migration. We look at uh, New Zealand as it stands today. One in four of our working age population was born overseas. Cities like Auckland, our only one international city, uh, second largest migrant city in the world after Vancouver, 43% foreign, foreign born. So we are a migrant country and a very multicultural country, but I think truly believe born off multiculturalism through a bicultural lens where we're all recent arrivals to New Zealand, but the relationship is underpinned with our tangata whenua, our Māori that's enshrined in, in our Treaty of, of, of Waitangi. So um, I guess that's my broad context for then to set, uh, I guess, the messages that I want to send around immigration. And I guess um, what, what I always say is the fact that immigration in New Zealand sits in the Ministry of Business, Innovation and Employment and is not part of the Department of Homeland Security or Immigration and Border Protection gives you a sense on which the primary lens we think about immigration in New Zealand. And it's not to say I'm not having a go at the US or the UK, our context is different. We are a small island nation at the bottom of the world 
a long, long way away from where all the conflict's happening, a long, long way away from where all of the uh, unprecedented amount of globally displaced people are. And, you know, uh, we, we often think about sometimes these are our challenges, but also the opportunities. We are, um, you know, a small island nation surrounded by treacherous water where the only way to really come and visit us is by plane. So we have some natural advantages in being able to manage some of our um, immigration risks. But you would have heard from Pete this morning in terms of the New Zealand story. I'm sure you've got a sense of that the current government, we're all about growing uh, the economy, uh, and it's an export-led economic strategy where we are basically really interested in attracting entrepreneurs, capital, the skills that New Zealand needs to grow the economy. And the fundamental mission of my organisation in life is to get the best people that New Zealand needs to prosper. That's our simple mission. And whilst, yes, we have some of the same challenges that overseas governments do around freedom fighters in Syria and threats of illegal migration and transnational crime, the primary lens on which we see the world and immigration is about how can we make sure that our settings uh, facilitate us getting the best people for New Zealand to do well. And it's an emphasis on the broader ministry that I sit in, uh, whose purpose is to grow New Zealand for all, with the emphasis on grow and for all, where we want to grow New Zealand. We want to be generating the types of economic value that allows us to continue to be a first world country uh, that has world class education and health and welfare systems but for all is about everyone has to benefit from that economic growth and it can't come at the expense of the environment or our people or in terms of putting them at risk in terms of going to work, in terms of health and safety or being exploited by employers. And, uh, you know, that's, that, that's our emphasis. So uh, I often get that that's not the case of people uh, interacting with overseas immigration uh, sort of services that view the world in a, in a different way. Um, over the next couple of days, you'll get to meet um, some of my guys, so Matt, Matt Hoskins and, and Nick and Jen, who uh, work in our sort of, uh, sort of skills, entrepreneur, capital attraction uh, sort of teams. They're really excited about uh, coming out here and, and talking with uh, you guys. I think we've enjoyed a fantastic relationship with uh, Matt and Brian and Yosef and Kiwi Connect. The um, thing that I suppose, for me, I get really excited about as a New Zealander is that uh, clearly, this is a that the tech sector is a really important part of our economy. It's probably the fastest growing sector of our economy. Uh, you know, we care deeply about uh, you know the creative sector and, and and arts. Lots of opportunity there, but I think it's about the alignment of the business opportunity with the alignment of values. And you know, if I replay back. Hopefully, I was listening. You know, we, we met with Matt and Brian and Yosef before Christmas. You know, around what you guys were reflecting is what you truly believe in in terms of a value set. That you know, technology is here. Sure, you make money, um, but it's here to solve the world's uh, problems. That th th there is a massive set of opportunities. I believe in terms of alignment of the opportunities in New Zealand with an alignment of values. We've got a range of um, you know immigration products, my one minute pitch, uh, that uh, can support those of you that are interested from an investment or living and working uh, sort of here in New Zealand. You'll find my team that's incredibly um, interested and in sit down and talk with you over the course of uh, you know, the rest of the week around uh, how, that, how that works. You will have heard this this morning, so I'm not going to repeat the New Zealand story. From a, from a business perspective, what I'd say to you is, look, I think we're incredibly proud of the fact that if you believe the World Bank, you know, we're the third most open economy in the world after Singapore and Hong Kong. We're number one for starting up a business. I think we're number two after Singapore or Hong Kong for the ease of doing business. Um, whilst it's not perfect, we've got quite a bit of certainty in terms of our regulatory environment. We're incredibly proud of the fact that uh, from a uh, values uh, point of view, we're number one in the world in terms of Transparency International. We are a corrupt-free government and uh, public sector, which again, I just think underscores what we're about as uh, New Zealand. So I want to leave lots of times, time for questions. So I just want to finish by saying, look, um, uh, you know, it's always dangerous in government when you say, hi, I'm from the government and I'm here to help. Um, but we truly are with, with you guys in, in, in this space. Um, 
you know, Joseph, I'd just congratulate you for becoming a resident of New Zealand, which is, you know, fantastic. <laughs> and, um, you know, continue to be inspired with what um, you guys are doing in Kiwi Connect in terms of the bridges that you're building, the connections that you're making, and off a base of, you know, a passionate belief in, uh, in, in New Zealand. And it's just, uh, you know, I, I feel very grateful uh, uh, for that. And, um, yeah, really, really look forward to uh, my team being able to explore with you both over the course of this week in an ongoing way about um, how we might support you in terms of pursuing um, opportunities here in New Zealand. So that's enough from me. Um, so I'll finish and say, uh, nō reira, kia kaha, kia maia, kia manawinui, uh, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, kia ora marau tātou katoa. Any questions, comments? My name is Joshua Fouts. Uh, I run a 25-year-old nonprofit called Bioneers, and we're focused on uh, practical solutions for some of the most vanguard issues of the day. Our founders, Kenny Elsabel and Nina Simons, are here as well. Um, the I, I was struck by this question. I wanted to ask it to the to the other government representative who was here, and I'm also an, uh, an alum of the U.S. government. I yep. started out at the State Department, but <clears throat> I've I really am viscerally struck by the fact that I've not seen. Um, any government with such a progressive stance as the ones you have, and the vo and and well, it's kind of 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 both of you um, to extend a message of, of of invitation. But I feel that the response that's coming out of me is, what can we do for you? Because mm -hmm. there there is something. Uh, really truly rare and unique about the policies you're implementing about the the cultural sensitivity po uh, policies that you're working on i mean it's there's nothing like it on the on the planet and mm -hmm. and i actually don't see you as 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 remote i see you on the vanguard mm -hmm. more less on the edge of the world and more leading leading the uh, the world at the tip of the spear so what can we do for you yeah, fantastic question. Um, and I suppose in a very applied way, um, the opportunity over lunch to talk about, I think that um, uh, to answer your question, I think it's going to be about um, actually the opportunities for us to collaborate and co-create co uh, around if you think about the strategic interests of the New Zealand government. So we're really interested in attracting capital entrepreneurs innovating, growing the high end of our economy. Uh, we see the opportunities in terms of the, uh, the tech sector, you know, technology, the, um, whether it's you know, ag, biotech. I think the questions that we are challenging ourselves with is saying, we do think we have some um, relatively good product that uh, our fundamental wiring and government um, again, hopefully not drinking our own jungle juice, but that we do believe is that we're probably more business-like than um, bureaucratic. Uh, and, and I think the opportunity comes from saying, if we have an alignment of opportunity and values, and we can frame up some objectives around, so let's, let's be aspirational. If we wanted New Zealand to be um, the next Silicon Valley, you know, the, at the next uh, innovative vanguard of well, how do we um, attract the entrepreneurs and the startups, then how might we co-create the, um, you know, the environment to, to do that? Um, because I think there are some concerns that some of our products, well, some of them are very good, that we might have some gaps. That, you know, the danger always with the bureaucracy is that we design things from the bureaucracy. Uh, and I think that there is um, quite an applied opportunity um, for us to get the, the right people out of the ecosystem together with the right people out of government and actually do some work that sort of says, you know, if the aspiration is, you know, a, a, a truly amazing ecosystem around startup that supports, uh, you know, technology, then how do we design that that together? So that that would be the way I answer that. And um, you know, basically a commitment. Uh, I think I, the the task that Yosef's agreed to is uh, we've got a big opportunity in a few weeks' time where we're having these conversations with um, the prime minister and the front bench of of government. And I think the opportunity to start to say, well, what 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 does some of the uh, innovation start to look like in this space? What are some of the uh, the big opportunities? But to do that in a way where I don't think it will be successful unless we can find a way of co-creating it uh, with, with you guys.
you soon tell from my accent I'm a Kiwi. Good on <laughs> so you. This is a Kiwi question. Yeah. Because what worries me a little bit on what you're saying is, is where is the partnership in this mm -hmm. for us? Um, these people came in and might be great, might be doing great things. Yeah. Where's the beneficial aspect to the resident party? And we only have to go back to Treaty of Waitangi and Maori and what Maori saw when they saw wealthier, more yep. skilled, more uh, lots of asseted people yep. coming into this country in the 19th century. Mm -hmm. And they thought they had a good deal there for a while until they saw there's a lot of downsides to that, mate. Yep. mate. <laughs> yep. You know? And I, you, I'm sure you're aware that there'd be a lot of Kiwis who will be, yeah, we're the most open economy in the world apart from a couple of small places like Hong Kong and Singapore and say, so, well, yep. you know, there's the downside to being really open. Yep. And, and what, are the, what do you see as the protections mm. in terms of the partnership being with us is this isn't going to increase the sort of educational opportunities for New Zealanders, the upskilling of New Zealanders? Yep. Or are we going to get displaced? Yep. You know, that's the argument, isn't it? Yeah, it is. And, 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 and you know, I'd be really interested in your comments in terms of how do you see yourself balancing up, trying to encourage people who, who will be helpful to New Zealand and what's way yep. of life or whatever, and how does that help the people already here? Yep. So I guess um, I'll start with uh, sort of what I think the narrative and the underpinning logic is and some facts. So what, what we know now is that uh, in terms of, so if I start from... Uh, immigrations primarily we view from a, from an economic lens, but not exclusively. So I think the other things that um, you know we're proud of as New Zealanders uh, is you know as a small country we we punch above our weight in most things, whether it's sport or science or or business. Uh, but we pride ourselves on for a country that's smaller than most international cities, um, the role that we play as an international citizen. So we do a bunch of things in immigration from a humanitarian point of view. So I think we're proud that we run what's recognised as the best refugee um, sort of program in the world. We only take 750 a year but we've taken tens of thousands since the, the 1950s and have a strong commitment to uh, you know, doing our bit in, in the humanitarian space, uh, that we have a unique uh, relationship with uh, Polynesia in, in particular in terms of our historical um, and deep uh, sort of roots with, with Polynesia. But some facts, we know that um, in terms of migration, it, it contributes a net uh, economic $3.2 billion to the economy over uh, New Zealand uh, sort of citizens. The, the, the tension that always needs to exist in immigration is the one that you're saying. Uh, you know, uh, are, we, are we so open that we're letting migrants coming in that are taking away uh, the work opportunities for uh, New Zealand, you know, New Zealanders to, to work, New Zealand kids coming out of uh, universally, and that's the bit where you've always got a design to get right. I think in this space, the fundamental underpinning is if we attract the right entrepreneurs, uh, we, we do this in a way that's aligned with what we um, stand for as a set of values, is the net contribution to the country in terms of the jobs uh, and opportunities they generate to benefit all New Zealanders, is I think the design principles that we have to hold to, because that that, that is the underlying tension that always exists in uh, the immigration space. So if I can make it, if I can make it real, a story that I tell that I'm pretty passionate about. Horticulture and viticulture sectors in New Zealand, really important part of our economy, what earns us export uh, dollars. Ten years ago, we had situations where uh, Kiwis didn't, Kiwi, Kiwis were either busy doing other things, but we had massive labour shortages, fruit dying on trees, a lot of employers employing migrants illegally, not very good practices out actually on vineyards and orchards and what have you. We now have a situation where we have uh, 9,000 Pacific Islanders coming to New Zealand every year for seven months of the year to uh, work uh, for employers in Horton Vit. What we know uh, and seen firsthand is that it's made a massive difference back in the small island nations. Uh, so in terms of real money going back, no bureaucracy involved like trade programs, start-up of micro-enterprise making a huge difference there. What do we know for New Zealand? We know that uh, whilst there are 9,000 workers coming in and, and, and doing that, that 
there is a less percentage of foreign nationals employed in horticulture and viticulture now than there was when we started this thing nine years ago, that sorting out the supply of productive labour has meant those employers have invested capital to grow their business, that we've got more New Zealanders employed in those um, sectors now than ever before. What they're not doing is picking the apples and chopping the asparagus. They've got the supervisory jobs, the admin jobs, the jobs in the pack house, and you say, I think that's what we're always trying to do is how do you design this thing at a macro level that, yeah, doesn't undercut uh, sort of Kiwis, doesn't suppress, uh, you know, wages and deny opportunity, but getting it right in a way that can grow the overall economy that creates more opportunities that benefits all, all New Zealand is the, is the way that I would answer it. And we don't always get it right, but that's the way I think that we have to continue to frame how we think about our immigration policies and products. Thanks very much for um, the great insights into immigration. I think it's something that um, you know, certainly I've uh, discussed a lot. And I just um, have a question in reference uh, really to the situation in Christchurch and a yep. policy that, that I imagine you know well uh, um, of. And it's the, the, this idea from one of the councillors in Christchurch about a we generation yep. um, entrepreneurship visa where yep. you, somebody arrives, and, but they're at the lower end of the spectrum in terms of their financial capital. Yep. And I'm uh, just wondering, do you see any sort of space for something like that around the very entrepreneurial mindset coming into the country mm. in large numbers? And given the opportunity to create something, and yep. if something is created, great. If not, maybe they, they go back to where they came from. Yep. Um, but I just wanted your comments generally, broadly, yeah. on, on that. And uh, yeah, cheers. So what I'm hoping that Yosef might do over the course of a few days, having all of you creative, entrepreneurial, um, you know, technologists in the in the room, is that's what we were talking about over lunch. You know, like if if we were going to really innovate and create some products that went to entrepreneurship, what might that what might that look like? And we're talking about we're probably in terms of our current products got some some sort of gaps around entrepreneurship in that in, in that way. And that's where I think that there's the opportunity to do a bit of innovating and co-creating around saying, well, if we were interested in that regard or, you know, truly believing that New Zealand could be some form of the next generation Silicon Valley or really attracting uh, you know, the entrepreneurs and start what might that what might that look like? And, you know, I don't know what that might look like, but I know that in terms of an alignment with what this government's all about, in terms of, you know, wanting to attract capital, wanting to attract entrepreneurs in a way that's of net benefit, uh, you know, well, it is a partnership. I mean, it's got to work from you guys from a business perspective, but also um, continuing to grow uh, the economy and the opportunities that, um, you know, exist going forward, then, you know, basically my message is, is all ideas, um, you know, all ideas welcome and, uh, uh, you know, believe that we, we could actually do some um, co-creation in this space. Other questions? Carl. Uh, kia ora. Um, I had kia ora. a wonderful uh, time up at Waitangi a few weeks ago, yep. um, camping out in the lower Marae area and... Uh, <laughs> hello. Um, and... Uh, also was at an event run by um, some of the independent Pākehā who were invited in to listen to the Ngāpuhi hearings mm -hmm. um, and re-learnt, re-understood our history. Um, and I wonder what the role is and could be uh, of Immigration New Zealand in uh, education about the treaty and about... It's a, it's a yeah, yeah. What, it, what, it, what it is now and what it might be. Yeah, I mean, um, you know, big, big questions, because I think there's still big questions about this in relation to uh, the New Zealand, uh, you know, population, let alone uh, the, the sort of migrant one. But, um, you know, I think at a, um, at a, at a, at a pragmatic uh, sort of level, uh, some of what this looks like in the best space, and um, this is probably a slither of what we do, is I think about, uh, you know, all, all 750 refugees that come to New Zealand every year. Um, they start off in Mangere in South Auckland at our refugee um, centre. I think the work that we've done with um, the local iwi Ngāti Whātua about the role uh, that Ngāti Whātua play in terms of, you know, everyone arrives uh, in uh, Mangere with a uh, 
Pohiri Nazi Fata are involved in the six-week orientation around what it means to be uh, a, a, a New Zealander is probably what it looks like at best. Um, I think the one of the big challenges for uh, us, and being very frank with you, I mean, I'm not sure how the conversation will go with ministers in a, in a few weeks' time, is saying one of the things that you know, uh, we're, we're a long way from perfect, yeah? Um, whilst I think we've got a great New Zealand story, and, and I passionately believe as a New Zealander that, um, you know, we, we have a strong bicultural base on which our multicultural society um, operates on. Um, there are things that, I don't know about you guys, but, you know, I'm sick of some of the problems that we talk about around, um, uh, you know, mouldy disproportionate and this, that, and the, the other thing is that, in my most optimistic um, I think that um, I think there are opportunities for us to do um, sort of more in the space around what it means to be a New Zealander, and from a um, fundamental bicultural lens, and the, the role of um, uh, you know the treaty and that, and, and people's understanding around it. Don't know what it necessarily um, sort of looks like. I think that uh, the opportunities. Uh, what's the Māori economy worth now? Forty billion dollars in terms of the assets that are stewarded by um, stewarded by Māori. I think that there are opportunities in terms of um, some different ways of thinking about the space. That one of the things that we challenge ourselves from a, a, a Ministry of Business perspective is that you know often the frame in, in government has all these problems that need to be solved with Māori. Um, I actually think that. Um, has to be tipped on its head around, and I think there are fantastic things going, um, you know, going on. But uh, you know, what, what's the opportunities to start to um, sort of leverage and work in partnership with Māori, who, uh, in terms of an economic base of forty billion dollars and growing? Uh, and I guess Peter, you'll talk about some more of this in a more intelligent way than I will, um, sort of, sort of shortly. But to answer, answer your question, I think that. Um, yeah, there's a lot of scope to do. Um, yeah, a lot of scope to do some things better and differently. Uh, I actually have a question for you too, Nigel. Yeah. Uh, when you talk about uh, economic development and economic prosperity and aligning that with values, yeah. Uh, sort of one of the challenges we come across is way of measuring value within an economic development paradigm. Yeah. So in even immigration perspectives. Uh, there's the inf investor one visa or investor yep. two visa where the way of measuring the value somebody brings is in dollar amounts mm. uh, while there are people who could add yep. so many different ways of values um, and also when you talk about people who are coming with alignment of certain values mm -hmm. how do you go about balancing those two and, and what are some of the ways that um, you're quantifying or measuring that yeah so at a um, you know at a broad level array, the way that immigration systems work, and it's not not that different from the international context, is um, ultimately you're trying to have settings that you're confident that you're going to get some net benefit economically and socially from the migration programs that uh, you run. That's generally um, fundamentally about um, health and, and and the character of people that are are coming into uh, the country. I think the, the the question about how do you define uh, economic values quite a is quite a tricky one. Uh, again, in an applied way, I'd say, you know, if I think about the conversation over lunch and the opportunities that exist in the entrepreneur um, spaces, um, a bit of co-creation that sort of says, right, well, if you really wanted to create, uh, you know, an, an entrepreneur sort of product that went to New Zealand having an ecosystem that attracted some of the best, um, but you also accepted that part of that's going to be, you're going to get some you're going to get some failures, some things that, um, you know, sort of don't work. I think it's how do you start to co-create and design that from a shared set of objectives and values, and I don't think there's a misalignment there. But the value question's a really difficult one to get to get right. I mean, to give you an example, this is at the, the sort of lower skilled end of New Zealand at the moment. One of the things that we're grappling with is saying, and these are, these are difficult things to grapple with, we've got increasingly... Um, migrants that are in New Zealand on a temporary basis um, doing jobs in sectors and regions of our economy that either Kiwis aren't available to do or don't want to do. So, um, 
you take the dairy sector, for example. Um, so I'm just going to try to keep this evidence-based, no emotion here, but just the things we're grappling with. Um, Ten years ago, migrants earned 3% of wages in the dairy sector. Um, today they, own, they earn 13% of wages in the dairy sector. We have increasing sort of cohorts of people predominantly from the Philippines working as dairy herd managers and assistant herd managers that are here as almost permanent temporary migrants because the way that we define value, which is about your qualifications and the wages you earn, you say, well, you've got no way to stay in New Zealand permanently. And increasingly we're saying, God, do we need to, do we need to redefine how we view value? But they're very difficult things to get right in whole of government um, sort of system. So, um, you know, look, I'm probably not answering your question. At one level, I say it's very difficult, um, very difficult to do. I think the best way that we have to do that, though, is again about saying, right, well, where do we have alignment in terms of um, our objectives, and how might you design this thing as best you can to be confident that what you're going to get out of this is net benefit for those that are involved, those coming here for the government in terms of doing this, and in a way that protects ultimately, um, you know, what is the New Zealand? Uh, what is the New Zealand story? Because I think the the, the thing, without being uh, naive, the thing that keeps me a little bit uh, awake at night is how much of um, you know all the positive New Zealand story and the the general social licence that we have around uh, immigration is by by good luck, good design, um, or what when something really goes wrong, um, you know, with immigration, will we be any different from? the US or the UK or Australia at the moment, that where we think we've got a deep social licence and people positively view migration, actually something goes wrong and it's in the public domain, you scratch the surface, um, how, how, how real is that, um, that social licence? So it's one that you, know, you just have to be so careful about when you design um, you know, your settings both for the country but also what you're holding out as the promise and what you're selling to those that you're trying to, um, you know, basically a trek to the country. One last question. Yes. Um, so I'd love to know a little bit more about the situation with the vineyards. I understand that you actually um, provide transport and yep. um, temporary immigration from a specific island of people yep. that come, and because that's a particular skill set. Yep. Um, in California, we struggle with this as well because yep. we have leaky borders, but it's we don't have enough people to do typically agricultural mm. work that it's the lowest in the pay scale and the mm. economics only work because that's what happens. But I'm curious yep. how you manage it here if you're actually inviting immigrants in yep. and provide, I understand you provide housing, but the detail yep. around that and how it works out economically would be important yep. to know. So I think um, uh, you yeah, can provide you a lot of detail on that at a, at a high level. I think one of the things that we're incredibly proud of in the, this program in the horticulture and viticulture sector is that uh, it's underpinned by really good evidence and research. And um, I think the things that make it work is it, it, it truly is a circular temporary migration program where we have 9,000 workers coming in, many of them are return uh, workers. We've worked and invested heavily in the relationships with the Pacific Island uh, sort of governments around all the work that goes in terms of selecting them, um, bringing them to New Zealand. The part of the social contract with employers is, well, you know, you guys have to pay uh, the airfares, well, half the airfares, you have to, you have to meet all the pastoral care standards in terms of, you know, accommodation hours, you have to pay above minimum sort of wage, but in return what you do get is um, certainty around a supply of productive labour uh, that has given those employers confidence then to get on and start to make investments and in growing their business. So we talk about it as triple win, so the fact is we know, uh, as the World Bank describes it, it's the best aid programme in the world because it involves no bureaucracy. You know, it's real people earning real money, taking real money back home, making differences in their own villages, starting micro-enterprise. Here it's created, um, you know, the, the confidence for those sectors to invest and grow and get bigger, and where there has been virtually no or minimal displacement of jobs for Kiwis, and that most more, more Kiwis are working than ever before in those sectors, um, but um, in, in the more year-round jobs in terms of supervisory, you know, uh, administration. So we think that that that's pretty much the main features of 
um, the program. I think the the, the other thing that um, Again, if I'm plugging a, you know, a New Zealand story in a very applied way, I think that the things that we never imagined when we designed the scheme that would happen uh, in terms of the deep relationships that now exist between employers in some of those Pacific islands, the villages, a number of employers that you know, are up there three, four times a year that are honorary chiefs in um, villages, the, some of the social connections. So you, you look at the top of the South Island, Marlborough, Nelson, that... Um, Again, without being too stereotypical, um, you'd characterise as probably, you know, it's where some of the um, uh, the skinhead groups have probably most flourished in parts of the South Island, where you actually have the communities coming together to celebrate the start of the season and the arrival of all their RSC workers, churches getting together into dom denominational church meetings to celebrate the start of all of our workers arriving again. So I think. Um, it's not just been the economic benefits, it's been uh, the sort of social benefits and the relationships that it's fostered both in communities and the relationships with uh, um, Pacific Island nations. And it's probably, uh, it's one, I, I don't know what makes it work in the New Zealand context. We've had Australia trying to do this for um, seven or eight years because they've got the same problem. We've had senior Australians over on secondment, but for whatever reason, can't seem to make it work in, the, in Australia and of course the US for the reasons that you outlined, um, probably a bigger set of um, challenges than we have and that um, you know the only way to us is um, basically on a plane. Um, so we've probably got some natural advantages. Well Nigel, thank you very much for giving us a sneak peek view of uh, what it means to be within immigration and uh, for sharing all your thoughts and vision. Thank you. Oh, thank you.